So tonight for the next half an hour or so I'm going to be talking about skin, hair and nails related to our hormones which is a big topic. I've had lots of questions so thank you so much for those of you that have asked questions and I'm sure many of you have got others. So I'm going to talk about a lot. I am going to add resources at the end and we're really fortunate actually because we've got Dr. Saj Rajpal. I've managed to persuade him to give up some of his Sunday evening as well. So he's just going to be in the comments. So don't um, inundate him. But if you have got questions, he will be able to just answer them. He can't give individualised advice, but he can give you just a, a, a few tips. And then at the end, some of the resources that we'll be sharing will be um, some of the information that I've done with Saj anyway, and some podcasts that I've done with him too. Um, so if you see his name coming up, that's him. He's a consultant dermatologist who knows far more about skin than me. So I am just going to give it as a generalist overview. But I thought I'd start with just a basic anatomy actually and physiology explaining what the skin is because when we think about the skin everyone just thinks it's about our face and when we think about menopause or hormone changes in the skin everyone thinks about our face and the reason that I'm telling you this at the beginning is that we shouldn't be thinking about just our face and how we look of course it's important but we need to remember more what the skin is it's a it's an organ, it's one of the biggest organs in our body and it has its own blood supply, it has its own nerve supply. It's really important that we look after our skin all over our body. And one of the problems is there's so much, um, people have heard me mention the term meno washing before, but trying to hoodwink women into buying products. And Saj and I have, have done a podcast about it, but there's a lot of products that you can buy for menopause skin. And I'll talk about this in a bit, but we have to be careful because we shouldn't just be putting something on our face and expecting it to treat our whole menopause, which I've said before, affects us systemically and affects every single organ and cell in our body so this is a picture which I can share on my story some of you might have seen it you can google it it's just if you ask for a, a diagram of the skin now it looks a bit grim it looks a bit weird but it's basically someone's taken a piece of skin and they've cut it so this is the top of the skin and most of us have got some hairs whether it's on our face on our arms on our legs there's fine hairs everywhere and they're obviously thicker hairs elsewhere um, but hairs have a function too they help to insulate they keep us warmer as well if we're cold they stick up to try and trap air to keep us warm um, and um, so and then this is, this is the area that I really wanted to show you though you'll see these blue and red lines and these are the blood vessels and then there's also um, some thicker areas there's the epidermis which is the the top that's like the protective layer if you like then you've got the dermis where there's lots going on there's lots of nerves going through this system in this area the sweat glands as well because obviously we sweat and lose moisture through our skin um, and then there's the bottom area where you've got um, uh, more bigger blood vessels going through so the blood vessels obviously I've said before when they leave our heart the aorta is a really big artery it's the biggest artery we have and they constantly then divide and divide into smaller arteries arterioles then capillaries so we've got this fine network of capillaries on our skin um, like just under the surface and obviously if we get warm those blood vessels dilate they get bigger and that causes us to um, flush but it else also helps to cool us down as well so there is a reason for that and the reason really I wanted to show you this was that just to visualize and understand that there's blood vessels going to every part of our skin all over our body we're providing our, our skin with really good nutrients and it's also the blue is the veins so the veins drain away any toxins from any of the cells in our in our, any of our organs but especially our skin as well and many people think the skin is just there to protect us, to cover our organs, and it's just a, a thing. But it's not. It's biologically active. It's changing every time we knock our skin. Obviously, dead skin cells are shredding all the time, and we're making skin all the time as well. But we know, as I've said many times before, our three main sex hormones, estradiol, progesterone, and testosterone, are very beneficial they're biologically active throughout our body and so they help with keeping our blood vessels healthy 
We know, and I've said before, that when we're perimenopausal or menopausal and hormone levels start to decline, it can affect the, the, the blood vessels. You can get some inflammation in the lining of the blood vessels. You can also get less vasodilation, so they become narrower. They don't um, dilate as much um, and they actually don't come to the surface as much as well. And so this means that if you don't have as much good blood supply to your skin, it's actually going to do various things. It's not going to give it all the nutrients as much as, as, as it would do otherwise. It's not going to drain all the toxins away, but it's not going to fuel and feed all those layers of skin as well. Um, and it's one of the main reasons actually that we do get skin changes, partly because of our blood supply, which is, I know it sounds a bit weird, but I think if you, if you know this picture, it can help visualize what's going on. And if you haven't got a blood supply to your sweat glands, which is this blob of pink here, or to the roots of the hairs, um, or even to the nerves, because every nerve fibre is fed by blood supply as well, then you can quite quickly see that this skin is going to get thinner. The dermis and epidermis isn't, doesn't have as much blood supply as well. So that's going to affect how everything functions. So quite a few people can, can affect their hair growth um, because they, the hair shaft, but also the roots affected. Um, the, the sweat might change. Some people get more sweaty, some people get less sweaty, but also the nerves don't work as well. And the nerves actually um, innovate the, the skin as well, the layers of the skin. So a lot of people have been asking about um, itchy skin and people can get itchy skin because the nerve fibers are quite confused. I've said before when I talked about um, how um, hormones affect our brain, you get this confused signal going on. So a lot of people find their skin becomes very itchy, even if they've had no physical skin changes. So they haven't got dry skin, they haven't got eczema, they've just got very itchy skin and it's classically worse at night time, which is when our hormone levels obviously are lower at night time. And it can really be very distracting some people have this thing called formication where it's like little insects or spiders that feeling of them crawling all over the skin really really horrible actually and that can just be due to um, the blood supply not being very good and the nerve supply being quite confused as well now the other part of the skin that's very important is the collagen which is like our building structure our protein that builds um the um keeps everything in place and keeps a structure if you like um and our collagen is lost when we become perimenopausal and menopausal because all our hormones progesterone estrogen and testosterone actually help build collagen and so a lot of people find that they they look different they're facial structure changes um, and they might have um, more loose skin elsewhere as well because of the, the lock, loss of collagen as well. The skin can, can become drier too because you get this moisture loss. There's also the skin produces sebum and, and various oily substances that keep the skin um, sort of not just hydrated, but actually um, moisturized in a better way. And so if you don't have that moisture, you don't have that sort of oily substance that's being produced, then the skin is going to become drier, it's thinner, it's not as, it hasn't got the same structure. And so the reason I'm telling you all of this, because if you know what happens to our skin and how it works, you can quite quickly understand that some of the skin changes that occur when we're perimenopausal or menopausal are because we've got a loss of those hormones. So it's no surprise that the skin becomes thinner, it becomes um, less elastic, it becomes drier, it be can become itchy as well and there can be hair loss on our skin but obviously also on our hair and I'll talk about hair in a, in a bit. So lots of changes and hopefully you can understand why it happens. The other thing that's important to understand is that because we don't have the blood supply going quite as well from the skin as well, like I said, any toxins don't get drained as well. So some people find that if they um, cut themselves, 
they don't heal quite as well as they would have done when they were younger, when they had more hormones in, the, in their body. And some of that is because the blood supply is not so good, giving the nutrients to and oxygen and all the chemicals that will help repair and fight infection, but also they're not draining. The, the venous blood system isn't so good. So all those, those sort of toxins, if you like, aren't draining. And we know that leg ulcers, for example, are far more common in women than men, far more common in menopausal women than men. We know following an operation, for example, it takes a lot longer to heal if you're menopausal than if you're um, not menopausal and you have those hormones in your body. And I've said before, those hormones are very anti-inflammatory. They help to fight infection. They help to repair the, the body as well. And the skin is no different. Now, a lot of women find that um, when they take HRT or if they take HRT, replacing those missing hormones, they notice that their skin improves. And there are some people who are more cynical about HRT, say, well, women just take it because they want nice, healthy, glowy skin. Well, maybe, maybe not. It doesn't matter why we take HRT. It's our personal choice. But as I've said at the beginning, the skin is an organ. It's a biologically active organ. So what our skin looks like is often represented, representative of what our organs in our body looks like. So if this is a generalization, of course, but if someone's skin is well hydrated, it's got a good um, blood supply to it, um, and then it's far more likely that, for example, our livers, our bone, our cardiovascular system, our lungs, our bowel is more healthy as well. It's some people call it like a window of what's inside. And so you can put everything you like on your skin. You can buy expensive creams and potions and lotions, but they're not actually going to go into your bloodstream and help the other organs improve. So if our skin is changing, we need to be thinking, is there anything obvious externally? You know, have we changed our washing powder? Are we allergic to something, for example? Or is it something from within? And we all know that old saying that, you know, it's, our skin is only as good as what we feed it, um, literally feed it, what we eat. And we do know that. And it's really important. I spoke about nutrition last week and how important it is to eat healthily, especially when we're menopausal because of the various changes that occur. And certainly eating well is crucially important when we're looking after our skin. Um, and um, Saj is very clear about what we should be using on our skin. There is so many expensive products that we could be using, but trying to keep it really simple, especially if our skin is is, is more drier or more irritated. We should really be looking at using very simple emollients um, and not putting loads of um, products on, especially if they're perfumed um, because it can affect not just the skin on our face but the skin elsewhere and I am going to add here also the skin in our around our perineum so our vulva um, um, vulval area our perianal so around the anus area that can often become quite inflamed as well so we have to be really careful using very um, simple products as well so our skin also needs looking after. It's actually been quite warm today. I've just been out for a really nice walk with a, with a friend and it was so lovely. And this morning when I did yoga, I could feel the sun on my face as I was doing it coming through the window and it's just lovely. But, and I know Saj is going to agree, we have to make sure that we use adequate sun cream, that if it's really warm, we should wear a hat. Obviously, um, make sure that we are protected from sun because sun damage is very, very aging. Um, and I don't mean in a sort of, you don't want to look old way, it's, it can be damaging to the skin and also can promote aging skin changes. So people can have um, more likely to have wrinkles, more likely to have damage skin as well. Um, some people find that when they're exposed to the sun they can get um, increased melasma so these brown spots, spots that can occur and I did do a podcast actually talking about melasma and skin with Dr Saj Rajpar and, and we've also written a, um, some information together on the balance-menopause.com website and some people actually find that their melasma worsens if they're pregnant, take the contraceptive pill, or sometimes taking HRT. Um, and it can reactivate in areas of sun damage. Um, and there are lots of other reasons why people can get melasma. So it's not a reason to not take HRT, but we should be getting treatment if, if we do have melasma, it's causing problems. So aside from skin, 
a lot of people have hair changes as well during the perimenopause and menopause. Now our hormones, estradiol, progesterone and testosterone are responsible for so much, thousands of processes in our body, but when they, the levels decline, it can affect our hair growth. So a lot of people notice their hair doesn't grow as well, it might become thinner, it might also become drier and the texture change, so the hair might become coarser as well. Um, and so putting on a shampoo or a different conditioner or a hair treatment might or might not help, but it's similar to the skin. We have to think about internally. What are we doing? How are we feeding our, our, our hair, if you like? Um, and so it is worth thinking about that. And a lot of people find that their hair and skin changes before they have other symptoms, or it might be that they haven't noticed the other symptoms, such as you know fatigue or low mood or memory problems um, or vaginal symptoms or cystitis. So if your hair or skin is changing, it's worth doing a symptom questionnaire like that's on the uh, Balance um, app and just reflect and think, is there anything else going on? Now, the other thing is there's loads of reasons why people can have thinning of the hair, hair loss, hair changes, um, and it's not related to hormones. And lots of uh, hair conditions can occur commonly in women during the sort of mid 40s, 50s as well. So you have to be really careful to make sure is it related to hormones or could it be something else? And certainly in our clinic, increasingly we do um, vitamin D levels, we do um, iron levels, we do a full blood count, we do a thyroid test, we also do liver and cholesterol tests as well. But it's important because sometimes an um, underactive thyroid gland can cause hair changes, iron deficiency can cause high, hair, ch um, hair changes as well looking at the diet because we all need different vitamins and minerals and you can't always test them in a blood test. Um, and so if people do have changes and we think that might not be related, it might be a coincidence and not directly related to hormones, it's always worth seeing someone who specialises in, in hair loss. A lot of people really worry about testosterone and hair loss. And actually, if you give testosterone at the right dose for that individual person, and monitoring them closely. Actually, I, in my experience, certainly in my clinic, I don't really see people who have hair loss directly due to testosterone. If they have had hair loss, often they say it occurs very quickly with testosterone use, and it can often take three months for a change, and then the hair loss occurs. So often, um, if you have had hair changes, the doctors often quiz you what's happened three or six months before, and it's often related to that rather than immediate thing. And so some people are more prone to um, hair loss or alopecia um, or even this male pattern uh, hair loss, but it can be more common in family members actually. So often asking or looking at your mother, your grandmother, aunties, if they've had hair changes, that can often run in families. Um, but it's, it, there's other, lots of other, other reasons why people have thinning hair or hair loss. And there's so many different treatments, but the treatments have to be individualized as well. So don't just Google hair loss and buy something that you think might or might not work for you. Make sure you see someone who really understands and can take a good history, not just thinking about your hair, but thinking about your whole body as well. Really important because I see lots of people that have spent often thousands of pounds going to see various trichologists and no one's thought about them systemically because there are sometimes some systemic conditions that can affect hair as well. We often notice and see and what lots of women report that when they're taking the right dose and type of HRT and testosterone actually, their hair growth and texture can improve. A lot of people taking testosterone find that their hair grows quicker, it's thicker, um, which is quite the opposite of what everyone says. Of course, if you take too much testosterone um, and you don't take the right dose for you, of course it can adversely affect your hair, uh, but taken properly is important. Some people might need to use different types of shampoos or conditioners. We should all be looking at our hairbrushes. Many of us don't change our hairbrushes as much as we should. If we're using um, straighteners or even a hairdryer, just, just check how old it is and see if you need to update any of your equipment as well. Um, so it is important to look at that. 
The other thing to think about with skin, which I'm sorry I didn't mention, some people have asked about acne, rosacea, even eczema as well. These conditions can flare up. So if someone has been prone to acne, maybe as an adolescent, you can imagine when their hormone levels are changing quite quickly as an adolescent and they get acne, when they become perimenopausal, they're having hormonal changes and acne can flare again. Um, usually, actually, when you give back hormones at the right dose and type, it can really improve skin and it can be very anti-inflammatory. But some people do need specific acne treatments as well. The same with rosacea, actually. It can often improve with hormones, but sometimes people need to topical and occasionally systemic treatment for rosacea as well. Now, the other thing people were asking, there were loads of questions about nails, actually, about nail ridges and nail splitting and breaking. Far more questions than I ever imagined. But actually, then I was reflecting what I was like eight years ago when I was perimenopausal. And one of the things that happened was my nails were breaking all the time. Now, my diet, my nutrition is good. Um, and I thought, I wonder what I'm missing. I wonder what supplement I'm missing. Or um, And nail changes, they, they grow so slowly, don't they? And um, so it can be hard to, to know like what it is in the past that's affecting your nails. Um, Taking oestrogen can have an effect, but the biggest thing actually, and there's very little research, I couldn't find anything, I was doing a literature research search earlier, um, is actually testosterone can be very beneficial for nails. And the nail ridges that can occur, that lots of you asked about, can be due to many things. And many of you, if you've been examined by a doctor, one of the first things we do is look at nails. Um, and when I was learning as a medical student, it's like, why do people always look at the nails, look in the mouth? But there's so much we can tell by someone's hands. It's really interesting, actually. So often when we look at nails, we might be able to tell if someone's anemic. We might be able to um, look at, um, so look if they're iron deficient, for example. There are other conditions that can affect the shape of the nail as well, and even the colour of the nail. But the ridges that can occur, I think probably can be related to testosterone deficiency. Um, but again, there's no studies because very few studies looking at women taking testosterone. But anecdotally, a lot of women notice that their nails become a lot stronger and smoother actually when they uh, take testosterone. No, you don't usually take testosterone. I don't know, any, I haven't got any patients who only take testosterone for their nails. They take it because they have reduced libido, but also mood, energy, concentration symptoms. And then after three to six months or so of using testosterone, they often say, wow, my nails are the strongest they've ever been. And certainly that's what I noticed. I found a picture as well when I was Googling on the internet earlier, just about our nails as well. Um, a bit gruesome for a Sunday evening, but this is a picture of a nail, like a finger being cut in half. So you can see the nail on the top. You can see the bone um, that's going down this white area. But then what I wanted to show you was the blood supply. So you've got blood supply going all around, feeding the nail and the nail bite bed. And this is like a looking at from above on someone's nail. And this is showing the blood supply really feeding the nail bed. You can see there's lots of blood vessels going straight up into the nail bed there. And it's just really so that you can visualize. When I've talked a lot about our blood supply and our circulation and how important our hormones are for our cardiovascular system, you'll soon quickly realize that when you um, don't have such good blood supply to our nail beds, they're not providing the nutrients that are, are needed. So even if you have the best nutrition in the world with all the vitamins and minerals you need, if your blood vessels are thin um, and, and sort of shrunken, if you like, and not feeding the nail beds as well, then all those lovely nutrients aren't going to get there. Um, and so any ways of keeping our cardiovascular system healthy really important. I've mentioned before that obviously taking hormones reduces risk of cardiovascular disease. Exercise is really important as well and obviously looking at nutrition. So I wanted to show you here, this is very exciting for me because this is my paperback book that's coming out. You can pre-order it now. The easiest way of pre-ordering it is going to my website, Dr. Louise Newson, all one word, .co.uk, and then just pre-order. There's different links of places. Um, but this is it, nice cheerful cover. But I am on page 174 is chapter six. 
and it's called Skin and Hair in the Menopause. And um, there are various um, things. It talks about what happens to your skin, hormones in the skin. There's a case study about somebody who's had acne talking about her experience um, and other, other skin problems and how to look after your skin. And then I've got um, an expert view and you can guess who the expert is, of course. It's Dr. Saj Rajpar talking about how to develop a skincare routine that works for you. And he makes it so simple and easy and cost effective, which is really important. And then I've gone through about hair loss as well. And again, Saj has written in that. So um, there's some evidence that we've linked to, some resources as well. Um, and so this book is updated and revised following um, my hardback. So it is different. We've got more detail, more information, more resources, and actually more experts and voices um, through it. So um, I'm very excited to have it in my real hands, but I just wanted to show you there is a chapter on skin and hair. So lots of information there. I will share resources and I hope it's useful just going back in time really to basic physiology and how our hormones work. So we need to look after our skin, but we don't need to think about it as what we put on it. It's what we put in it and um, how we fuel it, if you like, is really, really important. So I will post this on my grid and um, look forward to speaking to you next week. Have a good week and thank you for, for joining.